Thanks for joining us this week on Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Join your hosts, Chris Marriott and Paul Schreiner each week as they talk email marketing, life, purpose, faith, but mainly email marketing. If you're looking for some normalcy in these crazy times, you've come to the right place. Welcome back to Email Geeks at Home Drinking Coffee. Uh, my name is Paul Schreiner. Glad to be here. I'm as always, with my esteemed colleague, the uh, fan uh, loved. Yeah, don't. Yeah, there's only one fan favorite, and that's I not me. I didn't go that. there. There's only one fan favorite. Oh, and there's our guest. This is the most amazing intro we've ever done. Joined oh, mid intro, uh, and and that's fine. That, that's fine, Patrick O'Connor. Uh, fan favorite. That is good. They, no, this is perfect, Margaret. But but fan favorite. Oh, David, can you this is my favorite part. Of this. <laughs> and and, and uh, I haven't said a word no more to blow it. <laughs> no, that's my. <laughs> well, no, Story we, of my it, life. It, it's not life. your fault. We blew our original recording. We were we re-recording, and you came in, and so oh, that's good. that that's the magic of live recording, uh, right? Well, so. We're not going to, we're, we're going to keep it going, but, but we're, fan favorite, David, we've got it. You've got to do your magic on the uh, name uh, because we're not speaking to Patrick, Patrick O'Connor. I can find Patrick. That's okay. No, we want to, no, we wanna, there things. we go. There we go. Fan favorite. Always rely on him. So you, let's get right to it. Let's get right to it. Today we're joined by Margaret McMullen, our, our good friend, Margaret McMullen. Um, and a little background on her. She's a recipient of the 2010 NEA Fellowship in Literature. She's got nine award-winning books. She was a Fulbright, 2010 Fulbright uh, at the University of Pesh. Did I get that right? Pesh. Pesh. Uh, in Hungary, the country of Hungary, which I can find on a map. I'm not sure Paul could. We won't put that test, um, but I could find it on a map. Uh, she taught for 25 years at the University of Evansville, uh, Maryland Glick, Indiana Authors Award. I mean, bottom line, she's won an incredible number of awards, written nine books, and we're here to talk to her today, and we're delighted that she could join us. And, and I just want to say one thing real quick. Uh, in your book, the first time you mentioned Paige, uh, you give pronunciation. So from that point on, reading it, it was always correct in my head. So thank you. I'll just start by saying that. Standing. Yes, yes. <laughs> so thank you again for joining us today. Yes, so the book that Paul is referring to is Margaret's most recent book, Where the Angels Lived. And, uh, uh, and, and that's the book that both Paul and I have read recently. Oh, there we go. She has a copy. What a surprise. <laughs> it's an awesome book. Awesome book. All the stacks here, here. But, but Margaret has, has written, um, you know, both young adult books and adult books. Um, so let's start with, you know, what, how, do you, how do you think of, you know, wait, wait, do you decide that, do you, do you, you know, is your creative process, I'm going to write a young adult book or I'm going to write an adult book or does the subject sort of material come to mind and then you decide, well, which audience might it be more appropriate for? I wish I was so intentional as that. I think um, they call, pardon? is that called writing by the seat of your pants? I think so. <laughs> I think that is the technical term. <laughs> For what I do. And the first time that I wrote a young adult book, I didn't know I was writing a young adult book. I didn't even know what a young adult book was, quite frankly. That's really embarrassing on my part because, you know, when I teach, right. I right. tell my students, keep your audience in mind, blah, 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 blah. blah. And um, I had written one, one novel um, uh, when War All was still alive. That was behind me and I had written another novel in my mother's house but that had not yet been published right. and I was starting another book and then it later became How I Found the Strong but um, it was a short book about a, a boy who was left behind in the Civil War and, um, and it was basically a father-son story. I had just had a son uh, United States had just declared war on Afghanistan and I was just like kind of charged, I felt to write it. Mm -hmm. And um, it was my agent who said it was a ya, a young adult book. <laughs> 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 
And um, she said, I'm going to tell you why it's a, it's a, why it's a young adult book, why it's a ya. It's about a young boy. There's no sex and it's short. Okay. So I'm like, yeah, well, that's pretty much all my books. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah, that, that was Paul's one complaint about where the angels live. You know, and and, and, and there's, there is one book where like I have a, you know, heavy duty petting session in the woods, but even that, that's high school now. That's nothing now. That's middle school. That's true. You know? Uh, Marty. got more violent and there's got to be a little more nudity. Right. Mm, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Paul's like, yeah, I need that in my life too. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, was, was there any thought when you learned that this was a young adult book of turning it into a trilogy so that you could get a big movie deal like, you know, like, like Twi Twilight or, or was it a one and done? Did it just turn out one? And, there, was, there was no further story to tell. Thank you so much for asking that. I'm going to go to my stack of books here. <laughs> Cue this is the so book exciting. Stack. I know. This is terrible. This is this so, is so exciting. No, it's not. <laughs> Maybe it's for me, but not for you. But <laughs> so these are the two. This is how how I found the strong. Yeah. This is the hardback, which is you know abused because I, it was on the road with me for a long time, and then it came out in paperback. And then you know I I did get a an option to do for a movie for it, but that came a little later on. But I really did fall in love with this family in this first book. So I had a, um, an offer from my editor saying, you know, so you've written about a little bit about the Civil War. Did anything else happen in Mississippi? <laughs> so I wrote um, When I Cross Nobob, which is sort of takes up um, where how I found the strong left off. Okay. So a direct sequel or, or parallel, or, or like, like the, for Marvel, Marvel movies, they say the same universe, different group of people. It's, 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 it's reconstruction era. So it's after the Civil War, right. same group of people. I mean, okay. I, in my mind, I'm thinking box set. I had yeah. the little dolls. <laughs> yeah. I, you the had little, the movie? The uh, little Civil War dolls. And then again, like the Asian or the editor said, you know, did anything else happen? And I'm like, yeah, well, there's this thing called the civil rights movement. And then that's when um, I wrote Sources of Light. So again, they're like all related. Right. But I don't, and, and, and my, my publishing publisher, Houghton Mifflin Harcourt, their specialty is like um, um, educational books. So these are often on like curriculum lists and everything mm -hmm, and some right. and stuff, but they're never, I don't think, I don't know if, if, if a teacher has ever like, you know, taught them all together or if someone, but I do get the same kind of, um, uh, readers, uh, mm -hmm. you know, emails who have like read one and they, or they go back and read the other or um, so, so they're all, you know, I've got a little, got my, I got my fans. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm curious, your first email you received, what was that like? Oh my gosh. Oh my gosh. I was, I mean, I'm still that way. I'm like, oh my gosh. <laughs> you read my book. <laughs> it is just, I mean, it's just, it is so embarrassing. And I always wonder if other writers feel this way. And then, so anytime I meet a writer, I, I ask them, so like, what do you do about fan letters? And they like, they like light up. <laughs> They're like, oh, jo Joyce Carlos is like, oh my gosh, this is so great. <laughs> so you would say, if someone reads a book and they really like it, send that author a letter and say, yeah. hey, thanks. You know what, and, you, and knowing myself and knowing how I feel when that happens to me, when I read a book and I love it, I always write the author. Do you really? That I is do. a cool story. It is. I am so adamant about fan fan mail because writers are, I mean, we're just all alone in our little caves or our sheds or whatever, our room. And um, I mean, we, you know, and especially dur now during the right. pandemic when we're not on the road with new books or old books or whatever, you're not, you're not seeing people. And so you don't get this immediate gratification at all. Right. So, um, and I, I do think, I, I know that I have, res I 
like when I went into a classroom for the first time with a young adult book, there were a couple of things that happened. I was very glad that my editor cut out a four letter word that I did not have to read out loud in front of those right. kids. Good, which was good. My, which was a huge lesson. And, um, and also I saw so many girls and I thought, oh my gosh, I wrote a boy book. I need to write a girl book. Right. And I, and, and I don't think I, I, I thought that, and, I, and, I, and to me, that, that's not a hard thing to do, you know, to think up a, a girl character, but it's stuff like that, you know, and I'll like notice shoes and stuff, you know, yeah. another right. so good. but you know, it's just like, I need, I need to be fed, um, I need to be fed the world, I need, to, I need to see what's going on now to know, to know what to write to. I mean, mm-hmm. I, you just, you can't be, you can't be a hermit and really be a writer. I mean, you actually do have to be, a, you know, a part of the world. Right, right. right. Now, so are there, is there a group of people that you sort of socialize stories with? And hey, what if, what if my character did this? What do you think? I mean, do you do any of that? Um, I did for a while and then That's I realized- That's rookie stuff. <laughs> yeah, I know, I get it. You can get too many cooks, you know, in the kitchen. And everyone has an opinion. And also, I do think that if I talk too much about a story, right. I, I don't write it. Oh, right. okay. Interesting. You know? yeah. yeah. You yeah. can talk it out of yourself. That's fair. There was a painter, and I don't remember which one it was, but he said painters should basically cut their tongues out because you, you won't paint the picture. You'll, you'll talk about it too much. Right, right. And that's, a little, there's, that's the violence that I have given you now. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's 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 a uh, it's an extreme morning. Oh. <laughs> you know, and, and we're in such a flow here. I, I I hate to bring this up. Is it coffee? Is that what you're going to bring up, Chris? I have to bring up. Yeah, I mean, you know, Margaret jumping in in our intro threw all the timing off. You know, <laughs> and, right, look at so that. I want to make sure we talk about the coffee because that's in the name of the show. So, Margaret, what are you drinking? I have for you today. <laughs> A very old mug that's really looking pretty shabby, and I, I, you don't, we don't want to hear about the mug. No, we want to hear about the It's all open. It's all in bounds. Ah, okay. It's a cup of Starbucks. Oh, okay. We make it home. Do you have those little with skimming, or do you make a big pot? A big pot. The okay, currants yeah. drive me crazy. Okay? Yeah, okay. Yeah. They just, you know, it's hotel. Well, that it's the one thing that gets you up, you know? Yeah. They're very depressing to me, the Keurigs. Yeah. yeah. Not a fan. Yeah. yeah. Paul, what are you drinking? I'm drinking Boon Boona coffee today, uh, an Ethiopian <laughs> blend. Um, I've been drinking uh, some beans I don't like. And man, I'll tell you what, uh, Peppy pepped up is what happened. The good I have never drinking. met a bean that I don't like. Oh, is yeah. that right? Well, I, mean, I can I, find some for you. Yeah, I forgot to get the can today. I could I could walk off the. No, the, it's all right. Chris, but no, we, we, we know all know. Santa, I've, I've got the mug. Again, the Blu-ray mug. Hey, and, um, you, just, you, you just have to back down. <laughs> oh, back, back oh, there you go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, that, that's a story that we we told that story in the first season. This is from one of my boys. Uh, it's 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 a very. It, it, I don't. I don't look very good in the story. So uh, if you well, the mug. The mug is questionable, Chris. The the mug is. But but what's in the mug is Santo Domingo uh, coffee. And and Margaret, I will tell this story briefly. Um, uh, Santo Domingo is from the Dominican Republic, and it was just by chance that I was drinking that. uh, Started drinking that on the show. But um, what what happened is Paul's wife was given an all expense paid vacation. Uh, mm. to uh, the Hard Rock Hotel in Punta Cana. Wow. Um, yes. and, and they were going to go without any of the kids, just he and his wife, very romantic getaway. Unfortunately, this happened all around the time of the lockdown. So yeah. Paul has the dream of what might have been. Uh, it would have been the, so nice. The hope for a better future. 
Um, and Dominican Republic still remains just a, an aspiration for a him. hope. Yeah. And, is it, and, is it like on cold? I mean, can you still go there? Yeah. And, I mean, we have the tickets, but the the deal is, um, no I don't know when we're going to be able to retravel. Honestly, yeah. with, with our world the way it is. You know, Margaret's so empathetic that she's she the first one who's asked if you could still go if the tickets were still good. Nobody, most of us, sort of sort of enjoy the. Uh, sort of enjoy the story without wondering if he's going back. Okay, so we can we can get back on, we can get back uh, to to the real program. So, Margaret, you talked in the past um, in in some of the interviews and and, and um, that you've done. You talked about growing up around people who like to tell a lot of stories, and you know, we're and, and we're going to get into into you know your 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 uh, subject matter, your books in in a little bit, but but. Just, I mean, you have the most interesting, you know, family. I mean, you've got people from Mississippi, you've got relatives from Hungary, you've got relatives from, from Austria, um, and and so you, you you know you said you grew up about people telling stories, but it's not only about people telling stories, but but the broad range of stories that that you must have heard is is is, is this where your your own personal love of stories came from? Just uh, this atmosphere you grew up in made you say, I want to. I want to tell some of those stories. I want to make stories as well. Um, probably. And you're very kind to have done all that listening and research. Oh, we've done a and, lot. And thought. <laughs> I even saw you with the puppet. The puppet interview <laughs> might have been my very favorite. It might have been my favorite interview. That was, that was, yeah, that was very, uh, it's amazing was a very, how honest you can get with a puppet. Well, I just, I was trying to connect. Thank you for listening, puppet. I, I was trying to connect the, what young adult would, would, would be amused by a puppet. I was like this, I, I, I'm having, you know, kindergarten, young adult, Margaret. I, but um, yeah, I did, I did find that. There's, that there's all kinds of things to go through. I bet. <laughs> Many of them, fortunately, not filmed, or at least not something I could dig up. <laughs> oh, my goodness. <laughs> well, the, 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 the storytelling side of that question, um, I mean, most of it, most of the stories that I heard growing up were, were in Mississippi. I mean, those, mm -hmm. and, um, and then I, I met my, my mother's father and her stepmother later on, and they had, there, that was their, they, there was definitely their own way of telling stories and not telling stories. I mean, my grandfather, my mother's father, right. you know, he, he didn't tell about his past. I mean, as far as he was concerned, his life started when he, when he got to America, right. you know, and then went back. But I mean, it was all melancholy too, you know, right. and very, very, very academic and, uh, brainy and, and he kind of loved to intimidate in, in that sort of intellectual way. But you know, in Mississippi, you know, it was just all, let's talk about our great relatives. It was just right. all past. Well, right. heritage is powerful all in the past. South, right? I mean, and heritage is powerful present. in the South. Yeah, yeah, to a ridiculous romantic uh, right. level. Right. I mean, right. It was crazy. I mean, my grandfather would every Sunday if you were there at his house, we would go for a ride. We'd go to a ride and go to the cemetery. And granddaddy would take us and we'd stop for a little nip, which meant that he'd have to have a drink. <laughs> and we'd go to the cemetery and we'd go visit, you know, ma you know, mom, any or somebody else. And he would cry as he told the stories, you know, of how like, twin brothers died in the Civil War. And my reaction was, wait a minute, why did they die in the Civil War? Why did they leave? What, what, right. what, what? <laughs> right. So it was just, it was, a, you know, but that was so much a part of growing well, up. I, what I love, and this is me sharing my part of the story, you know, we moved from Washington State to Tennessee. Yeah. And, you know, Washington State is as far removed from the South as you can get, right? And we got here and when we first we found, found a church and, and we were talking with folks and I tend to hop into sort of real conversations early, right? And these are folks that they're, you know, they were, they're older in the church, but their grandparents 
fought in the Civil War, right? A known generation where I've always considered like the Civil War, that's so far right. ago, right? That's no, it's just ancient history. But yeah. like, I know people who knew people. Yeah. And that's mind blowing. So when you're talking about your family yeah. and you said grandpa yeah. taking you out, you know, on the wagon, going to the cemetery, telling the stories. I mean, that's, it's, it's, it's personal then. Yeah. Yeah. And I've heard so much about the war, the right. war <laughs> that I was so sick of it. And then okay. you know, when we moved north to Illinois, I, there was no way I was ever going to write about the South. I thought it was just, it was stunned, yeah. you know? Mm -hmm. It was already cliche, and I was like 12. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, what, growing up, though, you know, I, after I studied writing and everything, I even, um, there's a friend of ours, um, Richard Ford, who's a wonderful writer. He's also from Jackson, Mississippi, but he's, he's, he's not, he will, he's kind of a northerner come mm -hmm. to Jackson. Yeah. And he, I asked him for advice a long, long time ago. And he said, three things, never write about Mississippi, never write about the civil war and never teach. And he told me this just as I was back. going for my first teaching job. And I was starting and I wrote about a little boy in the South. You <laughs> broke all three rules. <laughs> well, when there's a market. Asked, it, I would say maybe is there a fourth rule because I've already broken the first. Oh, three. I know. <laughs> Give me something I can't. I I, I don't break. Uh, I saw I saw him last summer and reminded him of, <laughs> and I said basically <laughs> thanks a lot. <laughs> That's funny. I, I, I want to ask an esoteric question because this, this idea of storytelling and 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 you know I, I find fascinating and and so it, it, are, is a storyteller. Is storyteller and author mutually inclusive, or can you be one without being the other? And, I, and you know, are, are all authors storytellers? I mean, I guess all storytellers, if in an oral tradition, aren't authors. But can you be an author without being a storyteller? You know, I don't know. I, I honestly, I never think of myself as an author. I never even think of that word. I right. just, tell, I just tell, I just tell stories. <laughs> And I do, I even think with a, a, a dorky accent because I, I, I think the, um, the more hoity-toity for me, the more hoity-toity things yeah. get, I, I, I kind of uh, step away from that. It's mm -hmm. pretty basic. If you're not telling the story and if right. you're not entertaining within the story, forget forget about it you know right well it's a lot more approachable right and even yeah. as, as the storyteller or the author you need to be able to approach your characters and get in yeah. their heads yeah i mean it, it, being an author talking authorship and all that it, that starts dipping into criti critiques and all that mm -hmm. you know and yeah. that, i think it's i i appreciate all that but it, that's not that's not uh, what i do right. sure so we, we call we, we call and Paul mentioned the word heritage, and, and, and we've titled this episode "Unbreakable Heritage" as part of our unbreakable um, uh, season. And you know, you you write a lot about your family and your heritage, um, whether whether directly in where the angels lived, whether indirectly in um, um, the book with uh, that that's that that's almost a. a, a I wouldn't call it a prequel, but a but a other yeah. side of the coin in my mother's yeah. house. Yeah. Um, and and even even when you're writing about, as I heard you talking about it, even when you're writing about um, things like the the South during the Civil War, given given what you just said, in some ways that's heritage to you because your your father's family goes back to that time. So, um, you know, what is the importance of heritage to you? Um, and why and why is it such a drive? Why does it appear to be such a driving force behind a lot of your subject matter? Well, there's nothing quite like discovering who you are. It's like a big puzzle, right? I mean, the, we all feel that way. And, and then you know, we have the keys. These are parents, right? So they have their their all of their heritage, and that's part of yours. Right. So to me, it kind of 
is like a big old mystery novel, y you, you know? And I think that's really interesting just as a, as a narrative for life and for, for people who tell stories or write stories. Right. You know, it's like, you know, it's, it's like, it's, it's kind of a whodunit, but it's like, how did I get here? Right. And I think that what's amazing about it too, even if you don't write the story down, finding out about who your people are is empowering. You know, it, it, it helps, it, it helps you to know who you are and that, and knowing that helps you move forward. You know, it, there's, it, it is, it's such a subtle thing. I mean, you know, you meet people and, and sometimes you just know, gosh, that person is just so unfocused and so ungrounded. I don't think that person know who, knows who she is. Right. And sometimes I think, you know, you just start, you st just find out. And part of that finding out inevitably involves, you know, just knowing your people. It's just, yeah. you know, as we say in the South, who are your people? Right. I have a, you know, and I, so much of my questions are coming from a, a very much a fanboy perspective. Just, I really did just dig in on your book because it, it touched so many nerves, I think, for me. Because, uh, and, and my first question is kind of, you know, we have a, I think I shared in our pre-call, we have a, an adoptive daughter, right? She's from Ethiopia. And we love her dearly. Uh, one of the things, both sort of within the adoption world, but also just one of the decisions we made was that that's not our story to tell, her story. You know what I mean? And so one of the questions I had right away was, especially so, um, you know, the, the sort of backstory of the, the book, the, in a nutshell, you go to Hungary, or you go to Israel, right? Yeah. And, and discover a whole heritage you didn't know was 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 there mm -hmm. and and part of that was learning about a relative that had no documented history in sort of the holocaust museum holocaust memorial and 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 and, and the book is a lot about sort of unwinding his story to tell it and what really challenged me as i was reading it was like this is so different than the world that i'm living in where it's my job to protect my daughter's story because that's her story to tell. How mm. is it different that um, relative um, passed away and it's honoring? Help, help me. Oh, that's so interesting. You know, when I first found out about Richard Anglianese, this relative that my mom wait, 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 wait. You said oh. in the book it was pronounced Ricard. Oh, you're right. I've got, I'm going, I'm going, I'm going American English on us here. Point all that scoring. Proving we were paying attention. I might have gotten the name of the town wrong, but I do remember when you said pronounced Ricard. I am so impressed. <laughs> Honors program for you. Right. Awesome. <laughs> Paul, leaving you behind. So Ricard, but the, 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 the interesting tell is too, in, I had no idea how to pronounce it in Israel. So it oh, I'm sure. And, and, you know, there were no accents. And that's, right. that was another thing, just finding out why is this, why is this man Richard a name in this, you know, mm. Austro-Hungarian Austro family. So that was like this whole other mystery. Um, but when I found out about him and, and then found out that my mother didn't know about him and that her father just never told her or me about all of the relatives who died in concentration camps or who were murdered elsewhere in World War II, I did not feel like it was my story to tell. Right. Because, and that's, that's a, because I didn't feel like his relative yet. Right. I felt, I felt like, okay, maybe he's my mom's relative, but she doesn't know about him. But this insistence, this, this, this archivist, this librarian basically said, who was Jewish, and she said, it, it, you have to remember him in order to honor him as per, you know, Jewish, your Jewish heritage. Yeah. And, um, you know, I was like, yeah, 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 you know, 
but thinking, I'm not going to do this, but it really weighed on me. And it, 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 I didn't think I could rise to the occasion to take someone's story, to try to piece it together, to research it enough to, to do it justice. That was really intimidating for me. I'm sure. It, it always is at the beginning of any project. You just feel so humbled. Like, who am I to take anybody's life and try to piece it together into a narrative that's right. entertaining? Right. Yep. Well, because because it's different, right? Like when you write a, a a book, a story, your goal is in a lot of ways it's to inspire, but it's to entertain, right? Yeah. There's this this quiet sort of subtle pressure just below the surface that says it's my job to entertain people, right? It's the it's the bottom line goal, right? Right. Because there's also this very real aspect that you have to sell copies, right? Yeah. And and so, but then at the same time, you're now sort of given this role of honor Richard, Ricard, with uh, telling his story. And that's a huge weight. Yeah, it was huge. It was. And I mean, I, I felt like I'd had it before writing other stories for dead relatives, to put it bluntly. Yep. And I, I, would, I would get their pictures and like put mm -hmm. them over my laptop to kind of remind me, look, you know, don't mess with me. <laughs> you know, I wasn't, gonna, you know, because it's, you know, in the South, it's pretty easy to make fun of people. <laughs> right. Yes. <laughs> you know? I'm like the first one to go into a, to a funny accent or anything. But, you know, these are, these are, these are, it, when, when I'm, when I take from history or from relatives, I always kind of turn to a Faulkner-esque um, notion of basically, you know, raise them up. Right. Make sure you give them dignity. Do not make fun of them. Right. You know, not to say that it can't be funny sometimes, right. but, you know, it's really easy to make fun of people. And that's just not my intention. Well, that was very clear. I mean, honestly, uh, every, as, the, as the story unwinds, you know, going from when you uh, get, first get your fellowship in Paige. Um, which, which, I mean... Yeah, you know, if 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 you want to say there are unseen forces at right. work that in our important. lives, I yeah. mean, I mean, I mean, had that been a had it been a a fictional yeah. story, I would have said that's a preposterous. No, plot. And, and so just to set the the table on this, you yeah, were so for the, our, our yeah, you home. were you were working at um, a university here stateside. Yes, and. Stateside. Uh, you come across, uh, I think uh, my guess is probably doing a little bit of research. What we all do is, let me just hop on the computer and look up Paige. Oh, what can I figure it. out? That's it. Yeah. And, and, and in the process, you discover there's a, uh, a fellowship to come cool. to Hungary uh, for, for a quarter, for a semester, um, where you have to sort of propose a thing, uh, multidisciplinary, uh, and basically it's just a cultural exchange. I mean, is that, how close am I to that? It's so close, so, so right. So. Both of you are on the honors level. <laughs> <laughs> Marriott, I'm in. She so was, what was, tell me that moment when you went from the, the whole like, oh, that's a thing to that could be me. That could be, this could be, this could yeah. be it. Yeah, it was, um, I think it was February. It was like really cold, and I was doing this researching at, at the on the kitchen counter, and I had my little fluffy <laughs> slippers on. You know, details are important. <laughs> a little bit. And we can tell your writing is. What the, color the, were the slippers? Pink. The level of detail. <laughs> Excellent. She can tell you. I'm sure she could tell you, and even what <laughs> store she bought them at. <laughs> so. Um, the, I think the thing that did it was I, was I found that they need, they had never had somebody teach a creative writing class. Okay. And they also um, needed someone, they had never, they were really interested in someone teaching um, Southern American literature. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just thought, Very here nice. I am, here I right. am. Okay. Right. <laughs> Again, had this, been, had this been a fictional movie, we would yeah. have said, that doesn't happen. Yeah. That's right. Happen. Yeah. And then just like a little bit further research, I found out that um, the University of Page, it's, I mean, it's a wonderful place. I love it. Uh, 
the university. My colleagues were wonderful. But it was also one of the universities in the, in, um, the early 1940s that, and starting in 38, that started um, limiting the number of Jewish students and um, mm -hmm. faculty to basically go down to zero. So there was a certain kind of satisfaction yep. sure. teaching there. Right, to, right. And, 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 and just to keep this story going, I mean, I mean that, that was where, again, for people who haven't read the book, that, that is where this side of, of Margaret's family first right. started to prosper. First, that's where the story starts to take place before they, there's the Vienna faction and, and the Hungarian faction. Um, so, it, 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 you know, again, of all places, not just on the globe, but of all places in Hungary where this opportunity could have happened. I mean, it, it, it literally, yeah. the, the start of the, this blank slate, at least you landed on the ground uh, at, at the right place to start. And, what, and yeah. what, what stunned me, I mean, again, like Paul, I enjoyed the book and uh, immensely. I read it in probably two days or less. I stayed up all night. And, and what, what stunned me is, is how you start with nothing right. and, 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 but you fill, you fill in all the blanks. I mean, I know Ricard by the end of the book. I, I mean, I mean, I mean, you know, you put to shame everybody who thinks they've, you know, they, they, they've, they've got uh, 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 ancestry, you know, ancestry.com nailed. Um, uh, you know, they, 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 you know, the best ancestry.com person I've ever known doesn't have the level of detail that, that you were able to unearth and, and, and weave into, as Paul said, a, a, a fascinating story. Um, I mean, and, and not only that, what, 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 I, what also tremendously impressed me was, you know, oftentimes you get a lot of names thrown at you in, 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 in books. And, you know, I, a lot of times I'm constantly going back, okay, who is this person again? How, how, how are they part of the story? You, I mean, I never did that in reading your book. I mean, I, 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 mean, I, I don't know how you maintained the, I, you know, to me that the, your, your writing ability so, to maintain that, that, okay, I know exactly who this person is, even though I haven't seen their name for maybe 30 pages, right. I know exactly who she's talking about. I mean, I mean, that takes unbelievable, I think, skill to, to create such a vivid character in our head again, that we don't need to keep going back and say, okay, now how is he, how is, how is she related to the story? And I mean, I, you know, I mean, is that something you consciously work on when you're weaving the story? Or is it just that's the, you know, you write that way and, and, and thankfully you do? Well, thank you. <laughs> you, you remember when you wrote that awesome book? It was cool. <laughs> now you're, you're, I don't, that's, you're, you're, you're dropped from honors, Paul, on that one. <laughs> Well, I do, th I mean, it was a, it was sort of this accordion, you know, this manuscript, it, kept, it was, it started out as a massive, just this huge thing, and then it went small, and then yeah, <laughs> you yeah. just kind of do this back and forth. Right, but distilling it I think, I think the, the, a lot of the organizing and then making sure the names and the dates are correct, that's so much, that's, that really, ha for me, it happens in the editing, yeah. you know, like, the editing process is really like essential to me, especially with something like this. And one thing that happened last year is um, as I was going around to talk about this book, I would also sh show, like I had a little slideshow and people really responded to the pictures. Oh, yeah. And I was mentioning that to the publisher. So they just came out with this second edition that includes the, you know, a lot of the pictures and a lot of the pictures too, I got more as I would talk um, about this, mm -hmm. people were, um, it's almost a, it's, it's a whole other story, but when this book came out, there were a lot of people in, um, in Hungary and in Bosnia yeah. and in France that sent in to me pictures that sure. and they, wow. they felt comfortable coming forward um, as people who had hid the family or who knew the family or, um, or who were relatives right. and they were coming out. I mean, it was like a coming out thing. 
Right. And, and they also said, you know, cause like I used a couple of the pictures in the book and I wanted to credit them and they said, no, please don't mention my name. I mean, people are still, you know, in Hungary do not feel comfortable being Jewish. Right. Um, so right. that's like, you know, hello, 2020. Right. So the, right. the second edition um, has the pictures and also has um, these uh, questions for students and for adults, for readers groups, but also for students who are studying the Holocaust and, um, mm -hmm. and also heritage, um, their own heritage. Yeah. And, um, and this other woman also added, she just, she, she came up to me after a reading uh, that I gave in um, Delaware and she offered to do the index for me oh, wow. for free. And she's like an indexer. And yes, that is a job. Yeah. Wow. yeah well, right. And, and so valuable too. Oh my right? gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So there's an index there and, um, you know, just, it's a, it's a neat package available for you now. <laughs> One of the things as I was reading that I thought was so um, neat and be, you know, it's, it's more the cursory stuff. You got to do this with your, your son and your husband. Yeah. You did it together. You yeah. went to Hungary and, and I love that your husband became the English teacher, right? I know, I love that. <laughs> and I love that your son was playing drums at lunch, right? Like so much of this was like, yes, that's how my family would have done it. But again, by, by being able to do it together, it, it so, so reflected the sort of the underlying sort of ethos of the whole story, right? Like getting to know your whole family and doing it together. I, man, what a cool, cool experience. Yeah, yeah. And, and you know, and I ha in my mind, with, with my son James, our son James, I had us doing this book together, man. You know, he was going to be over there in one cemetery and I'd be over there in the other and we'd be collecting our debt. He got so sick of it. Oh, I'm sure. <laughs> but what was interesting to me was his, I, I don't want to say obsession, but he really got into the 1956 rebellion okay. and communism which was very much a part of his life. Right, right. Because, he, I mean, you know, he was, he was going to school with students who had grown up in multi-generational households who were very affected by, still, by communism. Sure. And that, you know, and that's a, you know, that's a big blanket statement. And what does it even look like? People were not open about, you know, talking about, what went on in their households. They didn't talk about uh, relatives so much. They, I mean, people, people kept their cards very close. I'm sure. Yeah, that's well, a total, you know, result of communism. And it's Eastern right. Europe, right? Yeah, it's Eastern Europe, right. And he was really interested in, you know, how this country, Hungary, was really struggling with democracy with this new Prime Minister, Viktor Orban. I mean, he was... Right. And, this, and you know, so much of that was like, to me, put on the side. But then it was just, it just started bubbling up and became sort of a subplot with the book, you know. Yep. You know, it just, it, it, the bureaucracy was to me incredible. But this was something that, you know, James was really interested in. I think he took away from that a real interest in, in democracy and government and all that. When it, you, you you talk about how how the book is is you know part part of search for your family's roots part historical and 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 his and, and the history part because i'm I, I was a history major in college and and so it was fascinating i mean i i mean the history and music paul i have a double major um, yeah, me too but uh wow. but there was a, <laughs> but the history was, was was great and 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 it is so important i mean what's happening around your family and 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 you know, I hadn't realized just sort of how sad sack the Hungarian experience yeah. was over time. I mean, from the Ottoman invade, I mean, they were under Ottoman rule for a long time. Um, you know, they were, then they were a part of, you know, uh, a Habsburg empire where they were like the ugly step, you know, yeah, the, definitely the junior partner in the Austrian Hungary empire. Um, and I don't even know how they got their name added to that. I mean, the Czechs were nice probably out of the 
the Czechs yeah. would probably be like, wait, it's yeah. history. Yeah. Way to lean into <laughs> capitalism. <laughs> um, and then, and then again, again, talking about, you know, I mean, there, there's sympathies with Nazi Germany and, and, um, the, and, the, and the communism. And, and, and I, I love the, you know, I mean, the context of all of this just added so much flavor, you know, how, you know, just the general hope, hopelessness, not hopelessness, but just sort of, you know what, nothing good's ever going to happen. Attitude of, of the Hungarians was, you know, I, uh, you know, understanding that and the roots of that, I think were essential to understanding the completeness of the story. Yeah. Right. There's, there was no way to write the story without going over there. Yeah. And um, I mean, I don't, no Hungarian, I can't speak it fluently. And, but to study it enough of a language really helped understand the identity of the Hungarian. Yep. It's, yeah. it, 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 you know, like the, you know, when you, when you, when you, when you introduce yourself, for instance, you don't introduce yourself, Chris Marriott, you would be, hello, my name is Marriott Chris. Got it. Yeah. So it's, and, and it, to, the, to the point where Chris, the name would go way at the end of the sentence. Sort of depersonalized. Yeah, you're, you're, the identity of who you are is pretty much nothing. Your family comes first. Right. Yeah, right. And your family is very much linked with the place too. Because you'd probably, there'd probably be a clump of Marriott's or whatever in a certain hillside or something. Yeah. Where you'd be picking your plums and everything. Mount Marriott is what it's called. That's what. Or, probably Mount raising Marriott. a few pigs. Probably raising a few pigs and goats. <laughs> and, 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 you know, I mean, I'll give you. Yeah. While, while you're talking about the the complexity of the Hungarian language and and because I, I I I'm a I have all these nerdy facts uh, filed away, <laughs> but you know I loved it when you also commented that that Hungarian is closer to Finnish. Than any other language that they're that that you know I mean they're basically they both originated from the same place in Central Asia, landed up in different places in Europe right. and and yeah, uh, you know I thought idea. you know there I said you would be if I were teaching the history class you would be in honors because because you know that I mean I, I thought I was about the only one on the planet who actually filed away that fact and, and yet there it was the in your book of it. Yeah, it's it's a it is a wild language. It takes a long time to say like hello and goodbye. <laughs> um, I have a question, and and I also have a comment I'd love your response on. But the question is, uh, there was a house uh, sort of out, kind of in the woods. Gypsies have taken over now. Starts with a J. How do you pronounce that? Yannisi. Yannisi. Okay, that is not that is not what was in my head. Yannisi. Janot Pelosi, something like. <laughs> oh yeah, the con the the cat the whole name, um, Yanisi Pulsi. Yeah, 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 not close at all. <laughs> what's in my head? <laughs> um, the other thing, and and I know, I don't want to say we're winding down on time, but at the same time, I want to make sure we get this in. One of the things that I absolutely um, took away from the book. Um, was about Ricard. Uh, and I wanted to make sure I shared it. One of the things that I thought you conveyed so well was his integrity. When you talked about him going on a hunger strike on behalf of folks he didn't know. Mm -hmm. um, before, before anyone was rounded up, before any of that, he saw injustice and he put himself at risk. You know, he had the name and the family to protect him a bit, but at the same time, that, that was a choice. He chose to sort of put himself out, which when you look at the Hungarian culture, that, that sort of I'm part of a thing to stand out is, is odd. It's different. And, and, and I picked that up, and I just wanted to say I thought that was one of those things that shined through. And then, and then you know, when you sort of transitioned into sort of the concentration camp where – he went on another hunger strike. Yeah. Again, I just thought, man, what, what a powerful message that was in there. And I wanted to say, hey, that came through loud and clear. Yeah. Oh, th thank you for saying that. It, 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 was, it really resonated with me, too. Just, you know, in, I felt like those were, 
that was key to knowing him. I mean, seriously, when I found out that this, that this guy was at Mount House in concentration camp, starving himself to death, willfully, yeah. you know, a, a Jewish friend of mine, like, you know, thought, are you kidding me? What do you, why, why would, you know, I mean, it was, it was, I don't want to say it was a joke, but it's like, oh my gosh. And then how do you convey, convey that that was heroic like you know mm -hmm. and and it is and it, it he did he was he was a white guy of privilege yeah um in, in his time and he didn't have to do that like in 1919 you know when he did that with the Serbs, um you know they arrested him they you know and basically he went on a hunger strike because they didn't he he claimed that the, the jews were being rounded up and treated right, poorly right. And they let him go. Right. So in, in that case, it worked, I guess. But yeah. um, it, 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 he, he, he struck me as a man, as, 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 as well as I could know him, he struck me as someone who, who was stubborn, mm -hmm. but who was always trying to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. He was the only one who didn't convert. Yeah. And... Um, you know, and I do think that's one of the reasons why he and his brother stopped talking to each other. Exactly. He okay. could not, he could not forgive his brother for converting. Sure. And, well, um, and it didn't save his life and it didn't say, you know, right. but I guess it eventually it did for the rest of his family. But, um, I think, I think really what saved their lives was he was arrested in the middle of the day and they saw, oh my gosh, if Richard can be arrested in the middle of the day, we better go right. into hiding. So um, anyway, I, 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 I learned to respect this quiet man. Um, unbelievable. I mean, he's so much with me. I, I mean, I still have his picture in my, you know, usually when I'm finished with a project, I put everybody away. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I get some more characters up there, but he's, he's still with me. I have a question and you, you can opt out of it, but I, it was sort of, you shared it in the book. And so, um, oh, I'm all out there. You <laughs> right. So ground has power, right? Where we stand, the, uh, hippie Paul, when I look in mirrors that have been around for a long, long time, I think about all the people who've looked in those mirrors before me and walking through thresholds of doors and, and holding doorknobs. It, it, there's this power to, to presence, right? So when you got to the concentration camp, M Mathausen, which I'm probably mispronouncing there too, how, how powerful was the connection to the land for you? Uh, it was really powerful. That was an amazing, that was an incredible day. And we didn't know, but it was like, it was Halloween. Oh. Um, and, uh, you know, when we went there, we, you know, we, I had the prayer, the Kaddish with me and I had the candles. I didn't really know if it was going to be a, I knew I was, we were all going to say the prayer of, of mourning for, for Richard when we got there. I didn't know where or how it was going to look. I mean, it was pretty unplanned. And what struck me was um, that my son and my, my husband, Pat, I mean, they were both as moved as I was. And they didn't have all the research that I had in my head. You know, they didn't know everything. But they knew well enough. I mean, you know. And there are some people I think that move through this world uh, tentacles out, you know, mm -hmm. they feel, they feel a presence. They don't want to get all ghosty and hoogity boogity, but <laughs> yeah, I, I really do believe that, um, that, that place is a kind of angel in that way, you know, that, that, mm -hmm. that, it, that it is a presence. It's a character. In our right, lives and, right. in, and, in, and in literature, and it's, it's yep. very, it was very present. The ashes are in the ground, you know, yeah. people died everywhere. It wasn't just one ash heap or one um, trench of corpses. They, they were everywhere, everywhere. Right. And uh, you could just feel it. And, it, and um, so when we found those two pine trees, 
um, and it was, it was sort of in the area where the Hungarians were in the tents. Um, we just saw it. We all looked at each other and thought, yeah, this is, this is where we you should knew. say the prayer. You knew. Wow. Inspiring. I mean, the whole, the whole, the whole book. Um, thank you for sharing your family story with the rest. Oh of my gosh! You know thank I mean? you for sharing yours. And I see the pictures of, on the wall of your your people. Yes. <laughs> you know it, it, the um, and and I know we we are running up uh, on an hour, but I, I did want to. You know, it's in, I know, I know you didn't write it. I mean, because you wrote in my mother's house first, and and that's sort of a to you know a fit for those not familiar with that book. A, a, I mean, how would you describe it? A fictionalized account? Yeah. Fictionalized? So I was when I wrote in my mother's house, Yad Vashem, the Holocaust Museum in Israel was being built. Okay. Okay. And so I didn't have access to any of this material, and I'm not sure. I'm not sure I would have found it, you know, because it, it, the, in, I mean, this is how old that book was. I, I mean, I was just getting emails. So that book, when I was researching it, was pretty much, I used facts, remember facts, <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and letters, a lot of letters. So I realized, and my mother wasn't forthcoming at all because she didn't know much about her mm -hmm. history and she definitely was not comfortable uh, with me writing about her sure. and right. she made right. it very clear so i realized pretty soon that i had to start making up things and you know my rule for fiction and nonfiction is one one fat one thing made up it, it becomes fiction right so um to me and it really freed me to you know um to to come up with a, the narrative right because i i mean you know having read both of them um I, I i think i enjoy the in my mother's house much more having read where angels lived even if there was some fictionalized elements because they sort of take i mean, I mean that book most of it occurs after where angels lived ended right, right. I, 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 that's not entirely correct no I, I know what you're saying chris but it was, it was, it was from a family history, from a heritage yeah. perspective, it yeah. takes a story of your parents and grandparents where they were left off and where angels lived. And I, and I yeah. so, so, all right, let me ask, so in, so was there an Ezra? I'm trying to remember who Ezra was. Ezra <laughs> is the guy. House. Um, the what? guy who lives with Elizabeth in New York. Right, not, no. Mm -mm. Nope. He's sort of a, you know, a made up guy. That was an interesting part. Oh, uh, I, I, can, I know. I love I, it so much. I know many Ezra's, but um, no, that's not my husband. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, I realized that. <laughs> he, I love it so much. But uh, I did, I, but I, I mean, I, I really enjoyed that book and I wanted to get my hands on the Mississippi book. Um, and I just, I wanna, the one, last thing I wanna say is um, one of the great, just one more great thing that Paul and I loved about, uh, where angels live, are some of the characters that come in and out of the book. The maestro is is potentially my favorite character uh, outside of, of Ricard in the entire book. And I swear to God, if they make a movie of it, and they and and the maestro ends up on the edit room floor, I will be protesting, picketing in front of every theater where it's shown because uh, you've got. I will write a very books. strongly worded letter. Very strongly worded because. The maestro is, is, but maestro was classic and the guy who runs the antique store. Yes. Oh my goodness. That was spectacular. Too. I told my I'm wife, not I told selling Betsy antiques to you today, ma'am. I, I, I said, here's how great the book is. We're going along on, on this story of, of search and, and relatives. And suddenly there's a sidebar about this. And the sidebar A has an incredible character. B. Yeah taught me something about how commerce works in Hungary, which is just because you walk in the store doesn't mean we're going to sell you something. Right. And in fact, in, in, in your case, the guy has squirted you out of the store. It's like, I'm not selling you anything ever. I and mean, you know, and I, even if he didn't want to sell me anything, I just kept thinking, I just wanted to talk with him too. I mean, he, this was a, this was a dashing figure in that store. Don't you like me? I know. <laughs> 
it. And that said so much about the American consumer too. You know, right. Not only right. the assumption that you can buy anything, but that the person who is in the store surely likes us. Right. <laughs> well, well, spoiler alert, it goes out of business eventually. Right. And, and as it should have. Um, Chris, would you wind us out with our yeah. uh, um, lightning round? Lightning round. And lightning round, Margaret, is I have five words. This is our Mississippi version of the lightning round. Is this like a test for me? No, it's not Very a test. It's, well, like a it's test. a psychological test. I give right. you, I, I give you okay. a word, and you you respond with the first word or phrase that pops into your head. Oh, okay. So yeah, very. So, very, very it's, 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 a, it's a very popular part of the show. Okay. And I typically have in mind what I think you're He's answering. loaded it. He's, he's taking it somewhere. It yeah. always is. It's always great. All right. So the first word, we only do five. First word, fried. Did you say fried? Fried. Okra. Okay. You like fried okra. Next one, <laughs> laurel. Wait, I'm sorry. You froze. <laughs> Oh, Laurel. 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 Laurel, Mississippi. It's what it's it's north of here near Chunky and Susta. Okay. Well, we'll, right we'll, by Chunky. To, wait, we'll come back to some of these answers, trust me. Uh, number three, Delta. Uh, dirt. Um, uh, library. Grandmother. Good. Uh, last one, aces. Oh, University of Evansville. <laughs> there you go. Oh, I would so disappointed. For those of you, we have that. That's where Mar uh, Margaret taught for 25 years at the University of Evansville, and Aces is their sports uh, team's name. So, um, the, the only one uh, I was kind of hoping I'd get green tomatoes to fried, um, but you know, okra is delicious, Chris. Like fried okay. okra and okay. fried pickles. Those are two things I discovered when moving to Tennessee. And, and, wow. and Laurel was, Laurel was really a test to see whether or not you watch HGTV, and you don't clearly because Laurel is there's a, and my, my wife and I watch it nonstop, um, and uh, I know, go figure. This is what I've been reduced to in my life, HGTV. But um, Laurel is one of their series called Hometown takes place in Laurel, and it's the rehabbing houses uh, in Laurel. So. It had you watched the show, you would have no doubt said hometown when I said Laurel. I think she might be frozen, Chris. Yeah, I think you might be frozen, Margaret. But that being said, we're also probably at time. Um, I wish that we could say thank you so much for this uh, time together. Um, and, because, I mean, um, it, 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 it touched nerves, clearly, for me, reading the book, hearing her tell her story and reconnect those ways. Yeah. And, 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 I, and, and I know clearly for you, to, it did as well. And I hope for our viewers, our watchers, our listeners, that it did as well. I can't recommend the book enough. I can't um, either. You go out and get a copy of it today. It's available in, uh, on Amazon as a, in Kindle format, as well as, uh, obviously, in, in book format. Um, I left a review on Amazon that just said spectacular. <laughs> Clearly write her a letter telling her the book is spectacular. Yes, because um, she will, she, you know, she'll read it. She will appreciate right, it. Right. And so um, what an incredible guest and what a great time. Um, again, I, w I wish she was still here. That's okay. And we'll just say uh, thank you. And we'll. Thank you, Margaret. Yeah, I and, really appreciate uh, it. And we can go right into the after show, I guess. And, unless, Producer David, is, is Margaret trying to sign back in or did she? Well, I, Chris, I got to jump onto a call, unfortunately. Oh, okay. So we'll, so now everybody knows we'll record the after show a little bit later. There you go. All right. But Margaret, thank you very much. Great show. <laughs> Welcome to the after show. Uh, again, uh, we want to thank Margaret. That was the outstanding. Uh, yeah, spectacular. Yeah, we really enjoyed speaking with her. Uh, again, sorry she froze at the end, but it was the end. Um, and yeah. uh, so we're all, we're all good. We're all good. So. A couple, lots to cover in the after show today, um, so but much. one of the first things that I wanted to cover uh, was um, in, in doing some research for Margaret's show uh, episode, uh, I came across an interview she'd done on, on uh, a public television in Mississippi, her home state, uh, the local Mississippi. Um, 
And, and imagine my shock when I saw it. I, I, I asked David, producer David, fan favorite producer David, to splice our opening video footage to the video footage of this program. Why? Uh, on Miz well, David, I, I, I hope you have it ready to run. Uh, what are we? You guys These are the kinds of things we should cover in the pre-show so I know what's going on, Chris. Uh, no, this is something I want, I want, to, I want to see your reaction live. Okay. Okay. So, you guys see? Yeah. Yes. It's our intro, right? Yeah. Starts with our intro. It doesn't look like because our intro has Skip Cataret's voice. It's the intro of footage. Oh, got it. Yeah. yeah. Now here's the footage to the Mississippi program. Very jazzy, upbeat. Do some of these images look familiar? Chris, I can't help but think they are, are copying our show nearly word for word. That's my point, right. I, 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 I don't care the fact that they came before us. Right. Uh, you know, well, there's just two possibilities here it is, is they've edited, they've gone back and re-edited episodes yeah. to add their new yeah. footage in after they saw ours, or producer David didn't do his homework and completely vet the originality of our intro footage when he created our intro. No, I mean, honestly, we would never, ever copy anything here. You know what I mean? No, so, of like, not. Themes, our, types, anything like that. Our um, integrity is, is, is too high. It, it just, it, was, it, it stopped me dead in, a, in my tracks. It was, it was clearly the same footage, uh, right. different scenes, but um, producer David, again. Um, I think it is pretty funny. That's honestly the idea that. <laughs> well, well, we, apparently we think a lot like public television. Right, right, I know. I mean, honestly, if there's one word to describe what we do, it's public television. Chris, I'm well, going to show you something here. Okay. Um, do you see this right here? I've been watching that the whole recording, yeah. What, what? That used to be a sign that said Chris Marriott stuck up there with tape. Now, if you look very closely at the back of the tape, that's my wall. <laughs> nice. I bet your wife was very happy about that. Well, she hasn't seen it yet. So that's, there's, there's, there's going to be a sort of let's fix this and make it go away mode. But I thought, you'd, I thought you would enjoy. I, I did. I, you know, I literally have been looking at that the entire show, wondering if that is the case. I was on a call. It was a pretty important call uh, last week. And, you know, it's got this sign up here that says Chris Marriott, which is the leftover from our, uh, our episode last week, where I right. created my own wall of, wall of Fame for Chris Wall of Fame. With Dr. Zeller. And uh, uh, so anyway, it's hanging up there. It says Chris Marriott, right? And somebody goes, who's Chris Marriott? And I was like, Oh, that's just, <laughs> just me being dumb. Don't worry, we're good. And I was like, oh. Not anyway, good. I got more. I got more for you, Chris. Hey. I'm coming home, I want to say Thursday or Friday. And what do I see? Can you see that? Yes. That's the A universe, universe cup, up. This is my yard, OK? This is our trash bin. There's our Eurovan. And someone had had uh, left their coffee mug on the street. Oh, but, but, but you called it the Universe Cup? Why? Yeah, the universe because the universe it? gifted it to me, Chris. The universe wanted yeah. me to have this cup. Because I don't uh, think it was left because they want to give me a special mug. You know what I mean? It's forces bigger than you and I. How many times did you run it through the dishwasher before you actually used it? A couple. couple. Okay. Couple, yeah. That that's at least a couple. I, I'm not sure my wife would have even let me use it after a couple. I got one um, more for you, Chris. All right, because then I got something for you. Okay, Chris. Um, we got some feedback from some viewers. I don't think you know about this. It was requested, uh, and I made a little chart for you. Okay, can you see that there? Yes. It says people who want more hand-drawn graphs. Okay. So you see here where we got one. And here is zero. That means these are people that want the graphs. These are people that, that don't. Does that make sense? Yep. If it doesn't, I also made a pie graph for you there. 
okay. people they want. <laughs> there you go. I got to give the people what they want, Chris. Okay. Well, I want to I want to get to uh, ask fan favorite David anything. Yeah. We were deluged, deluged with questions this week, and and uh, it was awfully tough to select the one that that right. uh, I wanted to pose to him. But I did I did manage to narrow it down. Um, so the, from from a from a fan in Peoria, Illinois, please ask producer. Please ask fan favorite producer David Inman what he thinks about people who are short turners. So, oh, David. Yeah, for sure. I think that's an important question. David, what do you think about short turners? Uh, I'm not sure I know what a short turner is. David! Oh, Sorry. well, well, fortunately, I thought that might be the case. So, let, let, I will show you what a short turner is, and then you can comment on that. So, here are, here's an intersection near my house. This is Beverly Road that we live on, and this is Wesley Road. It's two lanes in each direction. Notice the double line. Yeah. So here's a car coming to the end of, uh, and, you know, about to turn out on Wesley, and a car coming down. Yeah. So most people in making the turn, because uh, in making the turn, we, we call this the correct turn. Now, notice this angle of the road is, yeah, is true to yeah. form. It isn't a T. There's a little angle. Yeah. So the correct turn is going well beyond yep. and then turning back. down. Yeah. That is a correct turn. Now, what is a short turner? A short turn is somebody oh. who tries to cut the angle off, doesn't go out far enough. So as this car is beginning to make come out and potentially make its turn, the short turner, as you can see, there's – little bit of red there uh, indicating a collision or a, a collision is very likely to happen. So a short turner doesn't go beyond, doesn't clear the other lane, but rather cuts that other lane off in the turn. So that's what a short turner is. And so David, back to the question, what do you think of short turners? Yeah, thank you for clarifying what that is. I, I'm aware of that phenomenon, but I had never, never heard that term. So now I know exactly, exactly what we're talking about. Uh, and I, I think it, what's the what would we call the alternative to a short turner? A long turner? A correct turner? A correct turner. A correct turner. Yeah, I mean, I would just say a turner, Chris. But you know what? If you say a turner in the wrong context, somebody might think you're talking about Ike or Tina. Yeah, whereas, but I mean, the fact that you need to qualify and say this is a correct turner, it feels a little bit like maybe it's just a turner. You know what I mean? Like, let's just say, you know, the, the norm, the right way to do it, that's just a turn, a turner, right? Now, there's going to be people who overshoot it. That's called a long turner, right? People long who Long turners it. aren't dangerous. I mean, they might go off. They may, they may be Are dangerous Are you kidding to me? They're I'll not tell a you, no. To, they're Is that not a how danger. you live in Illinois, Chris? This happens. Listen, if this car... If this car starts to pull out as this guy starts to turn, you have an accident that's going to happen. Now, if he's 100%. a long turner, he may he may end up. Blue car you're, may you're end up. You're saying there's no that. issue with long turning. I right. disagree. I disagree fundamentally. David, long turn. Speak look, in here. Uh, well, we're break look, the tie. It, David, uh, we're not asking you to comment on long turners. We're asking you to comment on short turners. Yeah, we're no, not and I agree to, about that. Let's start so, there. Yeah, short turners. What do you think? Semantics aside, I, short turners. I uh, I have no patience for such things. Right. Um, I, I understand that life is fleeting. I understand YOLO, as they say. The kids. Uh, the kids say, but I I just uh, I, I'd rather wake up alive than wake up dead. Yeah. Yeah. Very very wise. Very wise. And uh, so there you have it. D Producer David does not like. Short turners. He's not a fan. He does not approve of them. Um, so thank you all for your questions this week that you sent in. Uh, keep them coming. Yep. Every week we'll try to stump David with at least one question. Lots and, of ways uh, to get a hold of us. Uh, we, you can now do it through Twitter with uh, coffee, at sign coffee email, I think is what it is. Um, we also have the Gmail account, emailgeekscoffee at gmail.com. Certainly Chris and I are both available all the places. Like and subscribe the YouTubes, follow us on the Twitters, you know, 
all the things. And, and uh, we're going to keep bringing you great guests like, uh, again, Margaret McMullen this week. I want to thank her. And again, we want to remind you all, uh, if you haven't gotten the book yet, go out yeah. and get it, Where the Angels Lived. Um, it's you'll a, thank us. Yeah, you'll thank us. It's an outstanding book. So thanks, everybody, for tuning in. Thanks, uh, producer David Inman. Uh, Paul, as always, a pleasure working with you. Absolutely. And we'll, we'll see you all next week with another very cool guest.